Welcome to the e-learning course on the Nibbana Sermons by Bhikkhu Katakuruna Nyanananda, an online course hosted by the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg in collaboration with the Barrel Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we will take up the first sermon, Sermon 1. And in this lectures usually the first part is open for me to take up comments suggestions and points that have been made on the online discussion forum by the participants and since this is the first sermon there has not yet been such a discussion therefore <clears throat> i thought i use this first space to briefly introduce these sermons and also to place myself in relation to them. So Venerable Nyanananda was invited to give these sermons by Venerable Jnana Rama, the meditation teacher at Nisaranavanaya in Mitrigala, Sri Lanka. It is a monastery in the strict forest tradition and uh, they were practicing intensive meditation according to the Mahasi method. Benalnyana Rama had slightly adjusted the Mahasi method by using uh, the nostril area for breath awareness instead of the rise and fall of the abdomen, in line with the general like among Sri Lankans for that way of practicing awareness with the breath. And in that context, in that monastery, the story goes that all those who joined that place at that time had made the strong determination that they would not leave the monastery until at least they have attained stream entry. So in this setting of the strict forest tradition, intensive meditation practice and an outstanding meditation master to guide the practice, he invited Venerable Nyanananda to give talks on Nibbana, as Venerable Nyanananda was himself an accomplished meditator, but also had uh, been an academic. And so he was able to approach that topic from by combining those two aspects, theory and practice, we may say. And these sermons were recorded in singular. And Bermel Nyananda speaks a very sophisticated Sinhalese. So some of his or some of those who later listened to these recordings found it a little difficult to follow him, especially those who have been brought up with English as their first language. And so they asked him if he could translate. And when he had uh, translated the first sermon, the one that we are going to be looking at today, he gave tapes to close friends. One of these tapes reached Godwin Samaravatna, a very well-known and loved meditation teacher in Sri Lanka, and he gave it to me. And when I listened to this talk in English, I was very thrilled. And I remember immediately the next day I went to visit Vanbanyanananda. He was living in a cave in the Kegol area at that time. And I just said, Bhante, please keep translating and I'll do all the rest. Means uh, that I was going to transcribe these uh, sermons. And also uh, because he has this uh, incredible memory that he just quotes Pali passages. Uh, he has just has them at his fingertips. But there was still the task uh, to find the references. And so... For all these altogether 33 sermons, uh, I had the honor and merit to transcribe them and to locate the reference the, in the PTS editions. And for me, this was uh, has had a lot of impact on my understanding of the Dhamma. I had earlier been learning uh, from Bhikkhu Bodhi. He had given all these talks on Majjhima Nikaya discourses and they had been recorded as 
tapes and were available at the BPS, the Buddhist Publication Society. So basically, I listened to all of his talks. There were lots of them. And from time to time, I would go to visit him at Forest Hermitage and ask questions. And that laid a very solid foundation for my understanding of Dhamma. And then I did basically the same with Vilmanyana Nanda, but with these Nibbana sermons. And I did not just listen to them, but transcribe them. And I would also regularly go to visit him in his cave and, and ask questions related to these sermons or other aspects. And so these two eminent monks have basically laid my the foundation for my understanding of Buddhism. And Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is very well known in the West through his translations of Majjhima Nikaya, Samyutta Nikaya, Anguttara Nikaya, and now he's coming out with the translation of Sutta Nipata and commentary. But the Venerable Nyanananda is less well known. And so because of the benefit I see in studying these sermons and also out of the wish to make his approach and teaching a little more widely known in the West, there is this idea of presenting them in an online course. And what I'll be doing is <clears throat> and just go through these sermons, read, out, read them out and offer some comments at times. I sometimes give alternative uh, translations, usually those by Bhikkhu Bodhi. The course is meant for the general public, so there will not be a discussion of Pali, Pali grammar. And for all those who are not familiar with Pali, I think it is just nice for them to just see a second translation, then this can sometimes make it easier to understand the passage. And sometimes I give my own ideas or comments. And I would just like to be very clear from the outset that these are not at all meant to be the final word on the matter. It is just meant as this is how I understand uh, what he says, and I, I just might be wrong. It's just an, another perspective and hopefully a starting point for further discussion. And in terms of translation and terminology, I have my own preferences and I just wanted to mention them at the outset. So usually Nibbana and Dukkha, these are two terms that I personally prefer to leave them untranslated. I feel they are just too rich in connotations to allow for a single English term. But if I were hard pressed, I think Nibbana, I would probably opt for going out or cooling down of a fire instead of extinction. And Dukkha, I would usually opt for unsatisfactory. I think suffering for Dukkha as a general characteristic of phenomena is uh, prone to be misleading. And Nibbida, I also would prefer disenchantment over disgust. Anyhow, these are just my personal preferences. So with these um, few introductory remarks uh, settled, now I start going through the sermon. And it opens with the traditional expression of homage to the Buddha. And then there's this motto that the Venerable has chosen for the series of sermons. Itang santang itang panitang yadidang sabbha sankhara samatho sabbhu padhi patinis sango tanhang kayo virago nirodho nipanang. This is peaceful. This is excellent. Namely, the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. With the permission of the most venerable great preceptor and the assembly of the venerable meditative monks, recently we have had an occasion to listen to a series of sermons on Nibbana. 
and there have been differences of opinion regarding the interpretation of some deep suttas or nibbana in those sermons. And so the Venerable Great Preceptor suggested to me that it would be useful to this group if I would give a set of sermons on Nibbana touching on those controversial points. At first, for many reasons, I hesitated to accept this invitation for a serious task. But then, as the Venerable Great Preceptor repeatedly encouraged me on this, I gave some thought as to how best I could set about doing it. And it occurred to me that it would be best if I could address those sermons directly to the task before us in this Nisaranavanaya, and that is meditative attention, rather than dealing with those deep controversial suttas in academic isolation. And that is why I have selected the above quotation as the theme for the entire set of sermons, hoping that it would create the correct atmosphere of meditative attention. Etang santang etang panitang yadidang sabbe sankara samatho sabbu padhi patine saggo tanhak bhayo virago nirodho nibbana. This is peaceful. This is excellent, namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. This is in fact is a meditation subject in itself, a kamatana. This is the reflection on the peace of Nibbana, Upasamanusati. Comment. Yeah, I like to offer my own alternative translation. It's just how I how it um, speaks to me. This is peaceful. This is sublime. Namely, the calming of all constructions, the letting go of all supports, the extinguishing of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. So I understand it to refer to the calming of all constructions. Yeah, and the term here is Sankara, and Sankara can have a range of nuances, but uh, I understand it particularly to refer to this mental conditioning or reactivity by ways of defilements. So the very tendency to react with defilements to a particular experience is in turn what reinforces that conditioning to react in future in similar ways. And so it's the calming of all these mental constructions as one of the epithets of Nibbana. Then the letting go of all supports Upadipadinisaga and here I find it helpful to turn to another discourse, the Gidimananda Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya. And uh, it has a series of different perceptions. And one is the perceptions of not delighting in the whole world. And here is Venmal Bhikkhubodhi's translations of what this requires. What is the perception of non delight in the world? Here Bhikkhu refrains from any engagement and clinging, mental standpoints, adherences and underlying tendencies in regard to the world, abandoning them without clinging to them. I find this uh, a useful gloss on what it means to let go of all supports. It means to let go of all mental supports, of all views and ideas and opinions to which we cling and which in a way build up our sense of so, the extinguishing of craving, I think, is clear, dispassion also. In the same Girimananda Sutta, dispassion and cessation are described in nearly identical terms. Therefore, I take the position here from dispassion to cessation to have similar implications. Dispassion is particularly on passion. Cessation, then, I understand to be the cessation of defilements, kilesa, niroda. 
In Nibbana, I would also understand along the same trajectory of extinguishing of craving, dispassion, cessation of defilements, the Nibbana of defilements, the going out, cooling down, or extinguishing of defilements. End of comment. I continue to read. So if we can successfully make use of this as both the heading and the theme of these sermons, we would be in a position to understand those six qualities of the Dhamma. We are told that the Dhamma is Svakkhata, that it is well proclaimed. Sandittika can be seen here and now. Akalika, timeless. Hipasika, inviting one to come and see. Opanaika, leading one onwards. Patchatang viritabbo vinyuhi, that it can be understood by the wise, each one by himself. This set of sermons would have fulfilled its purpose if it drives home the true significance of these six qualities of the Dhamma. Now at the very outset I would like to say a few things by way of preparing the background, and I do hope that this assembly would bear with me for saying certain things that I will be compelled to say in this concern. By way of background, something has to be said as to why there are so many complications with regard to the meaning of some of the deep suttas on Nibbana. There is a popular belief that the commentaries are finally traceable to a miscellany of the Buddha word scattered here and there as Pakkinna But the true state of affairs seems to be rather different. Very often the commentaries are unable to say something conclusive regarding the meaning of deep suttas. So they simply give some possible interpretations and the reader finds himself at a loss to choose the correct one. Sometimes the commentaries go at a tangent and miss the correct interpretation. Why the commentaries are silent on some deep suttas is also a problem to modern day scholars. There are some historical reasons leading to this state of affairs in the commentaries. <coughs> in the Ani Sutta of the Nidana Vage in the Samyutta Nikaya, we find the Buddha making certain prophetic utterances regarding the dangers that will befall the Sasana in the future. It is said that in times to come, monks will lose interest in those deep suttas which deal with matters transcendental, that they would not listen to those suttas that have to do with the idea of emptiness, sunyata. They would not think it even worthwhile learning or pondering over the meaning of those suttas. Yede suttanta tathagata bhasita gambhira gambhiratanta lokuttara sunyata patisangyutta there is also another historical reason that can be adduced. An idea got deeply rooted at a certain stage in the Sasana history that what is contained in the Sutta Pitaka is simply the conventional teaching. And so it came to imply that there is nothing so deep in these suttas. This notion also had its share in the present lack of interest in these suttas. <coughs> According to Manurata Purani, the Anguttara commentary, already at an early stage in the Sasana history of Sri Lanka, there had been a debate between those who upheld the precept and those who stood for realization. And it is said that those who upheld the precept won the day. The final conclusion was that for the continuity of the sasana, precept itself is enough, not so much the realization. Comment. There has been some criticism that this uh, passage in Manoratta Purani does not really refer to precept, but rather to learning. And I'm just giving here an extract. Uh, in Pali, Pariyatiyahi Antar Hittaya Patipati Antar Dhayati, Pariyatiyati Thaya Patipati Patitati. As a basic idea that when uh, learning disappears, the practice will also disappear. But as long as the learning is 
maintained stable then the practice will also stay and I think we need to understand this from the viewpoint of oral transmission that was at that time still the mode for passing on the discourses that according to tradition were spoken by the Buddha and his disciples. <coughs> so the task of memorizing suttas and then keep on rehearsing them uh, obviously takes up quite some time. And then the question is, what does one do with one's time? Does one engage in intensive meditation? Or does one rather uh, use it to memorize those suttas? And it is this decision that had to be taken at that time. And the decision then was that uh, it, emphasis should be on maintaining alive the tradition of the teachings so that then others can use them for their practice. And this is also why we benefit today if they had decided not to to give emphasis to the practice all out, uh, we would not have the Pali and Suttas now to have this course and for inspiring our practice. But I think the Venerable Nyanananda is still right in using the term precept because I assume that he is meaning to point to a general development that comes to a focal point here in this Manavata Purani passage, but which has roots further back in history and has a considerable impact on um, present-day Theravada tradition. And this is precisely the strong emphasis on maintaining the precepts. And there's an interesting passage, two interesting, three interesting passages from the canon that I would just like to briefly touch on. Two of these passages are from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. And so one of these, I give the references here, uh, is the Buddha's permission that uh, whatever minor rules, they can be abolished once he has passed away. But at a Earlier point in the same discourse, the Buddha teaches principles against decline. And one of these principles is that the monastics should not abolish what he has been promulgated. And they should also not promulgate something new. And so the friction between these two statements comes up at what is the first Sangiti, the Communal recitation is the translation I prefer, not council. At the uh, report in the Vinaya, because the assembled monastics are unable to come to an agreement, what exactly are those minor rules? And this is a rather major issue, and uh, the account of the first Sangiti reports that eventually Mahakasapa uses that same phrase that we find in Mahaparinibbana Sutta about not uh, abolishing what has been promulgated to for the decision that nothing will be abolished. I have um, studied this and on the online forum you will be able to download the article Comparative Study of the First Sangitin of its impact on uh, Theravada monastic identity. And I think it's just helpful to understand the historical background for this strong emphasis, particularly in the forest tradition uh, of Theravada Buddhism on the upholding the precept and giving particular emphasis to that. End of comment. Of course, the efforts of the reciter monks of old for the preservation of the precept in the midst of droughts and famines and other calamitous situations are certainly praiseworthy. But the unfortunate thing about it was this. The basket of the Buddha word came to be passed on from hand to hand in the dark. So much so that there was the risk of some valuable things slipping out in the process. Also, there have been certain semantic developments in the commentarial period. And this will be obvious to anyone searching for the genuine Dhamma. 
It seems that there had been a tendency in the commentary period to elaborate even on some lucid words in the suttas, simply as a commentary requirement. And this led to the inclusion of many complicated ideas. <coughs> By too much overdrawing in the commentaries, the deeper meanings of the Dhamma got obscured. As a matter of fact, the depth of the Dhamma has to be seen through lucidity, just as much as one sees the bottom of a tank only when the water is lucid. Dve nama king, namancha rupancha. What is the two? Name and form. This is the second part of the ten questions Buddha had put to the Venerable Samanera Sopaka, who had attained Aranship at the age of seven. It is like asking a child, can you count up to ten? All the ten questions were deep, the tenth being on Aranship. But of course, Venerable Sopaka gave the right answer each time. Now it is the second question and its answer that we are concerned with here, Namanchiru Pancha. In fact, this is a basic teaching in inside training. Comment. Yeah, I found it helpful to look at the context of this um, question answered by the Venerable Supaka. So there's altogether 10 such exchanges. It's actually um, a catechism, I think, a basic catechism on aspects of Buddhist doctrine. All being subsist on nutriment is one. The three feelings, the four noble truth, five aggregates of clinging, six inner sense spheres, seven awakening factors, noble eightfold path, the nine abodes of beings, and the ten factors of an arans. And I think this is um, somewhat similar to the principle that also underlies the Anguttara Nikaya, many of the discourses in there, and its parallel, the Okotrika Agama, that in an oral uh, setting, if you have like a numbered list, it's very easy to memorize it. And as you can see, I mean, several of these are doctrinal, but one and nine are, I don't know how to call that, maybe related to nature, we could say. It's just a basic rundown of, of, of central topics that one has to memorize. And the Venerable Sopaka evidently had memorized it correctly. And um, I wanted to add that uh, personally, uh, I was uh, at first a little puzzled by the taking up of this uh, catechism. And eventually I understood, and this is just my, 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 my take on it, I think Venerable Nyanananda wants to build a bridge immediately to the meditation practice of those monks and who under uh, Venerable Nyanarama, to whom he refers as the Venerable Great Preceptor, are practicing the entered monastery. And now if we keep in mind that they are practicing according to the Mahasi method, then uh, for the Mahasi method, uh, a very important point are the so-called insight knowledges. And the first one of them is Nama Rupa Parijeda, the, <coughs> <coughs> the delimitation, clear understanding of name and form. So I think what uh, Venerable Nyananda is uh, doing here is just pick up this statement on name and form by a, by a child uh, to, 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 to connect that to the initial insight knowledge that sets the basis, the foundation for the remaining of the insight knowledge is that according to the Mahasi tradition and also other Theravada Vipassana traditions that operate with this system is like what one has to experiences that one goes through uh, leading up to one's attainment of stream entry. Not 100% fixed, but a basic pattern of experiences, inside experiences. And the basic one, the, the foundation of one is really to, to have this distinction between name and form. And I think it is to, to bridge over to that, that Benamanyana starts us off with the topic of name and form. And using the example of a child, the bringing out the profundity of what at first may appear very simple. 
and uh, at the later point he also speaks of slowing down being like a child slowing down is another um, characteristic of the Mahasi tradition uh, anybody who has seen people practicing this tradition they will have noticed they do this very very slow walking meditation lifting up a foot very slowly and putting it down very slowly being aware of every single aspect in this process of just moving one foot and so it's a characteristic of the inside training in the Mahasi tradition to come back to this very close detailed attention to very simple matters like walking or doing other things and almost childlike attitude to really wanting to explore what most of us think well, we, we know there's nothing to really look at it and I believe it is uh, in order to bring out that aspect uh, that informs the first topic taken up in this sermon end of comment It is obvious that Nama means name, and in the suttas also Nama, when used by itself, means name. However, when we come to the commentaries, we find some kind of hesitation to recognize this obvious meaning. Even in the present context, the commentary Paramatta Jyotika explains the word name so as to mean bending. It says that all immaterial states are called Nama in the sense that they bend towards their respective objects and also because the mind has the nature of inclination. And this is the standard definition of Nama in Abhidhamma companions and commentaries. The idea of bending towards an object is brought in to explain the word Nama. It may be that they thought it too simple an interpretation to explain Nama with reference to name particularly because it is a term that has to do with deep insight. However, as far as the teaching in the suttas are concerned, Nama still has a great depth, even when it is understood in the sense of name. Nama sambang anbabhavi nama bhiyo navinjati nama seka dhammas sabbeva vasam anvagu Name has conquered everything. There is nothing greater than name. All have gone under the sway of this one thing called name. Comment. I just wanted to offer an alternative translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Nam has weighed down everything. Nothing is more extensive than name. Name is the one thing that has all under its control. And I was struck by the Somewhat different translation of Anva Bhavi the, in the first line as conquered or weighed down. And so just out of curiosity, I went to check up the Chinese parallel in Samyukta Agama. And here is the complete Chinese of that verse and, and that Chinese character that corresponds to the first line means to surpass. The so name has surpassed the whole world. And name is superior in the world world. So in the Chinese, the first and the second line are saying pretty much the same thing. End of comment. Also, there's another verse of the same type, but unfortunately its original meaning is often ignored by the present day commentators. Beings are conscious of what can be named. They are established on the nameable. By not comprehending the nameable things, they come under the yoke of death. Comment. I just offered, I'd like to offer the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi of the same. Beings who perceive what can be expressed become established on what can be expressed. Not fully understanding what can be expressed, they come under the yoke of death. End of comment. All this shows that the word Nama has a deep significance, even when it is taken in the sense of name. But now let us see whether there is something wrong <coughs> in rendering Nama by name in the sense of the term Nama Rupa, in the case of the term Nama Rupa. 
To begin with, let us turn to the definition of Nama Rupa as given by the Venerable Sariputta in the Sammaditi Sutta of the Majmanikaya. Virana Sanya Chetana Pasamana Sikaron, Idam Vuchatavu Sunnaman, Chatuntani Chamahabhutani, Chatunan Chamahabhutan Upada Yarupam, Idam Vuchatavu Surupam, Iti Danchanaman, Idam Chirupam, Idam Vuchatavu Sunama Rupam. Feeling, perception, intention, contact, attention. This friend is called name. The four great primaries, and form dependent on the four great primaries, this friend is called form. So this is name and this is form. This friend is called name and form. Comment. In my own listening to this first sermon for the first time, this passage was particularly important and the explanation that Venmo gives later on for me to get a clear understanding of the significance of name in early Buddhism. And I, if I remember correctly, it was when coming across this passage and the subsequent discussion that uh, I decided I must do whatever I can to help make this material uh, more widely available by putting my service at the service of Anubhanyana Nanda. The understanding of name as referring to all four immaterial aggregates is pervasive not only in the commentary period but even in Chinese Agamas. In the case of the Samaditi Sutta, uh, there's a Samyukta Agama in Tibetan parallel which abbreviate the Madhyama Agama, and here I'm giving the phrase defines name by way of the four immaterial aggregates. This is a problem because it would include consciousness. And particularly in view of the reciprocal conditioning between consciousness and name and form, a topic we will take up in a later sermon, this would make consciousness self-conditioning. does not work, I think. As the definition given here in the Pali version does not include consciousness. Basically name as all those aspects that process what we experience, but it's not the knowing itself. And uh, I was lucky to find that uh, in the Ekotrika Agama, we have a similar definition of name as in the Pali tradition. Name, name as involving all these mental activities, I call them, without consciousness. And I'm giving here the references for anyone who wants to look that up to my comparative study of the Majjhima which will also be available on the discussion forum. End of comment. Well, this seems lucid enough as a definition. But let us see whether there is any justification for regarding feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention as name. Suppose there is a little child, a toddler, who is still unable to speak or understand language. Someone gives him a rubber ball, and the child has seen it for the first time. If the child is told that it is a rubber ball, he might not understand it. How does he get to know that object? He smells it, feels it, and tries to eat it, and finally rolls it on the floor. At last he understands that it is a plaything. Now the child has recognized the rubber ball not by the name that the world has given it, but by those factors included under name in Nama Rupa, namely feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. This shows that the definition of Nama in Nama Rupa takes us back to the most fundamental notion of name, to something like its prototype. The world gives a name to an object for purposes of easy communication. When it gets the sanction of others, it becomes a convention. While commenting on the verse just quoted, the commentator also brings in a bright idea. As an illustration of the sweeping power of name, he points out that if any tree happens to have no name attached to it by the world, it would at least be known as the nameless tree. 
No, as for the child, even such a usage is not possible. So it gets to know an object by the aforesaid method. And the factors involved there are the most elementary constituents of name. Now it is this elementary name and form world that a metadata also has to understand, however much he may be conversant with the conventional world. But if a meditator wants to understand this name and form world, he has to come back to the state of child, at least from one point of view. Of course, in this case, the equanimity should be accompanied by knowledge and not by ignorance. And that is why a meditator makes use of mindfulness and full awareness, Satisampajanya, in his attempt to understand name and form. Even though he is able to recognize objects by their conventional names, for the purpose of comprehending name and form, a meditator makes use of those factors that are included under name, feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention. All these have a specific value to each individual, and that is why the Dhamma has to be understood each one by himself. This Dhamma has to be realized by oneself. One has to understand one's own world of name and form by oneself. No one else can do it for him, nor can it be defined or denoted by technical terms. Now it is in this world of name and form that suffering is found. According to the Buddha, suffering is not out there in the conventional world of worldly philosophers. It is to be found in this very name and form world. So the ultimate aim of a meditator is to cut off the craving in this name and form, as it is said, Acchicchitannangida nama rupe. Now if we are to bring in a simile to clarify this point, the Buddha is called the incomparable surgeon, Sallakato Anuttaru. Also, he is sometimes called Tanha Sallasahantaram, one who removes the doubt of craving. So the Buddha is the incomparable surgeon who pulls out the poison-tipped arrow of craving. We may therefore say, we may say therefore, that according to the Dhamma, Nama Rupa or name and form is like the wound in which the arrow is embedded. When one is wounded by a poison-tipped arrow, the bandage has to be put not on the archer or on his bowstring, but on the wound itself. First of all, the wound has to be well located and cleaned up. Similarly, the comprehension of name and form is the preliminary step in the treatment of the wound caused by the poison-tipped arrow of craving. And it is for that purpose that the meditator has to pay special attention to those basic components of name, feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention, however much he may be proficient in words found in worldly usage. It may even appear as a process of unlearning down to childlike simplicity. But of course, the equanimity implied there is not based on ignorance but on knowledge. We find ourselves in a similar situation with regard to the significance of Rupa in Nama Rupa. Here too we have something deep, but many take Nama Rupa to mean mind and matter. Like materialists, they think there is a contrast between mind and matter. But according to the Dhamma, there is no such rigid distinction. It is a pair that it is interrelated, and taken together it forms an important link in the chain of Paticca Samopada. Comment. I think this is a very important point that the mind-matter duality does not apply to early Buddhism. End of comment. Rupa exists in relation to name, and that is to say that form is known with the help of name. As we saw above, that child got a first-hand knowledge of the rubber ball with the help of contact feeling, perception, intention and attention. Now in the definition of form as chattantari cha mahabhutani chattunnan cha mahabhutanam upadaya rupam, the four great primaries are mentioned because they constitute the most primary notion of form, just as much as feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention present, represent the most primary notion of name, conventionally so called. 
Even so, the four great primaries form the basis for the primary notion of form, as the world understands it. It is not an easy matter to recognize these primaries. They are evasive like ghosts. But out of the interplay we get the perception of form, rupa samnya. In fact, what is called rupa in this context is actually rupa sanya. It is with reference to the behavior of the four great elements that the world builds up its concept of form. Its perception, recognition and designation of form is in terms of that behavior. And that behavior can be known with the help of those members representing name. The earth element is recognized through the qualities of hardness and softness. The water element through the qualities of cohesiveness and dissolution. The fire element through hotness and coolness. And the wind element through motion and inflation. In this way one gets acquainted with the nature of the four great primaries. And the perception of form Rupa Sanya that one has at the back of one's mind is the net result of that acquaintance. So this is Namarupa. This is one's world. The relationship between Rupa and Rupa Sanya will be clear from the following verse. Yatnta namanche rupanche asesam uparudnjati patigang rupa sanya che ette sachidnjati jata. This is the first found in the Jata Sutta of the Samyutta Nikaya. In that sutta we find a deity putting a riddle before the Buddha for solution. Anto jatta, bahi jatta, jattaya jatita paja, tantangotama puchami, koimang vijataye jatta. There is a tangle within and a tangle without. The world is entangled with a tangle. About that, O Gotama, I ask you, who can disentangle this tangle? The Buddha answers the riddle in three verses, the first of which is fairly well known because it happens to be the opening verse of the Visuddhi Magna. Sinipatitaya narosa panyo chitntang panyancha bhavayam atapi nipako bhikku so among Vijataye Jatam. This means that a wise monk, established in virtue, developing concentration and wisdom, being ardent and prudent, is able to disentangle this tangle. Now this is the second verse. Yesang rago cha ndoso cha avijja cha virajita ki nasava arahanto te sang vijatita jata in whom lust, hate and ignorance have faded away. Those influx-free arahants, it is in them that the tangle is disentangled. It is the third verse that is relevant to our topic. Yatha namanche rupanchen asesam uparudhyati patigang rupa sanyacha ettesa chidnjati jata. Where name and form, as well as resistance and the perception of form, are completely cut off, it is there that the tangle gets snapped. Comment, I just offer the translation by Pico Bodhi of this last verse. Where name and form ceases, stops without remainder, and also impingement and perception of form, it is here this tangle is cut. End of comment. The reference here is to Nibbana. It is there that the tangle is disentangled. The coupling of name and form with Patika and Rupa Sanya in this context is significant. Here patiga does not mean repugnance, but resistance. It is the resistance which comes as a reaction to inert matter. For instance, when one knocks against something in passing, one turns back to recognize it. Sense reaction is something like that. The Buddha has said that the whirling is blind until at least the Dhamma eye arises in him. So the blind whirling recognizes an object by the very resistance he experiences in knocking against that object. Patika and Rupa Sanya form a pair. Patika is that experience of resistance which comes by the knocking against an object. And Rupa Sanya, a perception of form, is the resulting recognition of that object. The perception is in terms of what is hard, soft, hot or cold. Out of such perceptions common to the blind worldlings arises the conventional reality, the basis of which is the world. 
Knowledge and understanding are very often associated with words and concepts, so much so that if one knows the name of a thing, one is supposed to know it. Because of this misconception, the world is in a tangle. Names and concepts, particularly the nouns, perpetuate the ignorance in the world. Therefore, insight is the only path of release. And that is why a meditator practically comes down to the level of a child in order to understand name and form. He may even have to pretend to be a patient in slowing down his movements for the sake of developing mindfulness and full awareness. So we see that there is something really deep in Nama Rupa, even if we render it as name and form. <coughs> There is an implicit connection with name as conventionally so-called, but unfortunately this connection is ignored in the commentaries when they bring in the idea of bending to explain the word name. So we need not hesitate to render Nama Rupa by name and form. Simple as it may appear, it goes deeper than the worldly concepts of name and form. Now if we are to summarize all what we have said in this connection, we may say, Name in name and form is a formal name. It is an apparent name. Form in name and form is a nominal form. It is a form only in name. We have to make a similar comment on the meaning of the word Nibbana. Here too one can see some unusual semantic developments in the commentary period. It is very common these days to explain the etymology of the word Nibbana with the help of a phrase like Vana Sankata Yatan Hainikantapta. And that is to say that Nibbana is so called because it is an exit from craving, which is a form of weaving. To take the element Vana in the word to mean a form of weaving is as good as taking Nama and Nama Rupa as some kind of bending. It is said that craving is a kind of weaving in the sense that it connects up one form of existence with another. And the prefix ni is said to signify the exit from that weaving. But nowhere in the suttas do we get this sort of etymology and interpretation. On the other hand, it is obvious that the suttas use the word nibbana in the sense of extinguishing or extinction. In fact, this is the sense that brings out the true essence of the Dhamma. <coughs> For instance, the Ratana Sutta, which is so often chanted as a paritta, says that the Arans go out like a lamb, Nipmbanti dhira yatha yang padipu. Those wise ones get extinguished even like this lamp. Comment. Uh, here is the translation, the forthcoming translation by Bhikkhubodhi of this verse. The old is destroyed. There is no new origination. Their minds are dispassionate toward future existence. With seeds destroyed, with no desire for growth, those wild ones are extinguished like this lamb. <coughs> I um, personally, as I mentioned at the outset, um, prefer going out or becoming cool instead of extinguishing or extinction. I mean, after all, uh, the lamp is still there. It's just that the flame has gone out and the lamp is becoming cool. So I would find it more natural to say the lamp has, the lamp has gone out rather than to say that it is extinguished. But this is just my my personal take on it. End of comment. The simile of a lamp getting extinguished is also found in the Dhatugi Bhanga Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya. Sometimes it is the figure of a torch going out. Panjota Siva Nibbanang Bimokho Chetasu Ahu. The mind's release was like the extinguishing of a torch. The simile of the extinction of a fire is very often brought in as an illustration of Nibbana and the Angi Vajjagotta Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya. We find the Buddha presenting it as a sustained simile, giving it a deeper philosophical dimension. Now when a fire burns, it does so with the help of firewood. When a fire is burning, if someone were to ask us what is burning, what shall we say as a reply? Is it the wood that is burning? Or the fire that is burning. The truth of the matter is that the wood burns because of the fire and the fire burns because of the wood. So it seems we already have here a case of relatedness of this to that 
Pachyata. This itself shows that there is a very deep significance in the fire simile. Nibbana as a term for the ultimate aim of this Dhamma is equally significant because of its allusion to the going out of a fire. In the Asankata Samyutta of the Samyutta Nikaya, as many as 33 terms are listed to denote this ultimate aim. But out of all these epithets, Nibbana became the most widely used, probably because of its significant allusion to the fire. The fire similarly holds the answer to many questions relating to the ultimate goal. The wandering ascetic Vajjagottan, as well as many others, accused the Buddha of teaching a doctrine of annihilation. Sadu sattasa utnchedang vinnasang vibhavang panyapeti. Their accusation was that the Buddha proclaims the annihilation, destruction and non-existence of a being that is existent. And the Buddha answered them fairly and squarely with the fire simile. Now, if a fire is burning in front of you, dependent on grass and twigs as fuel, you would know that it is burning dependently and not independently, that there is no fire in the abstract. And when the fire goes out with the exhaustion of that fuel, you would know that it has gone out because the conditions for its existence are no more. Comment. Yeah, the fire simile has been much discussed. And uh, two points are being made uh, sometimes. One is that, particularly for us in a Western country, the idea of um, going out of fire is less... Um, easily seen as something positive than for somebody who lives in the hot climate of the area of India where the Buddha was living. I mean, right now here we are just coming out of winter, so for me uh, fire has this connotation of, of pleasant warmth and not uh, necessarily connotation of oppressiveness, of heat that it would have to somebody who is uh, in India during the hot season, for example. And then this is a point to be kept in mind, uh, can also be seen, for example, from a use of the term Nibbana in the Mahagandhya Sutta, where Mahagandhya uh, says to the Buddha, this is Nibbana, I'm healthy, my body is well. The Buddha, of course, says that this is a misunderstanding of Nibbana. But the idea is, he is saying, look, my body is not, I don't have fever. My body, my body is cool and, and healthy, and so this is Nibbana. This brings out one aspect of the uh, basic meaning of Nibbana as a going out or cooling down of fire. Another point uh, sometimes made is that uh, there are certain connotations that go with the going out of fire. And here I have uh, two passages from Upanishads uh, to look at. And uh, it should just be clear that we, the implication is not that these Upanishads in this form were already in existence at the Buddha's time, but the suggestion is often that uh, some such idea would have been at the background of uh, the ancient Indian audience when the idea of an extinguishing or going out of fire comes up. One is from the Svetashvatara Upanishad. It says, a form of fire, when latent in its source, is not seen, yet its seed is not destroyed, but may be seized again and again in its source by means of the drill. And the Maitri Upanishad, it says, even as fire without fuel becomes extinct in its own place, even so thought by the cessation of activity becomes extinct in its own source. So the basic idea uh, here is that fire, when it goes out, it's not just completely disappeared, but it reverts to some sort of unmanifest state from which it can be then made to burn up again whenever the appropriate conditions are there. And uh, my personal take is that this, as well as the awareness of the oppressive connotation that heat would have had in ancient India, are useful to keep in mind uh, when we are operating with this um, idea, motive of the dis extinction or going out of fire, but I also feel that they should not be taken too far.
I, I, I do not think it is possible, as sometimes is being uh, alleged, that uh, the fire simile actually points to some sort of uh, that that it carries the, the that the fire simile in its early Buddhist usage carries the connotations that we find in these Upanishadic passages. Yeah, I, I think that would be going a little bit too far. End of comment. As a sidelight to the depth of this argument. <clears throat> It may be mentioned that the Pali word Upadana used in such contexts has the sense of both fuel as well as grasping. And in fact, fuel is something that the fire grasps for its burning. Upadana Patanjaya Bhavo, dependent on grasping his existence. These are two very important links in the doctrine of dependent arising, Paticca Samopadam. The eternalists overcoming overcome by the craving for existence thought that there is some permanent essence in existence as a reality but what had the buddha to say about existence he said that what is true for the fire is true for existence as well that is to say that existence is dependent on grasping so long as there is grasping there is an existence <clears throat> as we saw above the fire what is called upadana because it catches fire the fire catches hold of the wood, and the wood catches hold of the fire, and so we call it firewood. This is a case of relation of this to that, idapapatjayata. Now it is the same with what is called existence, which is not an absolute reality. Even in the Vedic period there was a dilemma between being and non-being. They wondered whether being came out of non-being or non-being came out of being. Katang asata satjayata. How could being come out of non-being? In the face of this dilemma regarding the first beginnings, they were sometimes forced to conclude that there was neither non-being nor being at the at the start. Na sadasit no sadasit tadhanin. Or else in the confusion they would sometimes leave the matter unsolved, saying that perhaps only the Creator knew about it. <coughs> All this shows what a lot of confusion these two words, sat and asat, being and non-being, had created for the philosophers. It was only the Buddha who presented a perfect solution, after a complete reappraisal of the whole problem of existence. He pointed out that existence is a fire kept up by the fuel of grasping, so much so that when grasping ceases, existence ceases as well. In fact, the fire simile holds the answer to the tetralemma included among the ten unexplained points very often found mentioned in the suttas. It concerns the state of the Tathagata after death, whether he exists, does not exist, both or neither. The presumption of the questioner is that one or the other of these four must be and could be answered in the affirmative. The Buddha solve, solves or dissolves this presumptuous tetralemma by bringing in the fire simile. He points out that when a fire goes out with the exhaustion of the fuel, it is absurd to ask in which direction the fire has gone. All that one can say about it is that the fire has gone out. Nibbhututveva <coughs> sankangachati. It comes to be reckoned as gone out. It is just a reckoning, an idiom, a worldly usage, which is not to be taken too literally. Though this illustration through the fire simile drives home to the worldling the absurdity of this presumptuous tetralemma of the Tathagata. In the Upasiva Sutta of the Parayana Vanga of the Sutta Nipada we find the lines Atanjiyatavata vegena kittinto atantang paleti na upeti sankam like the flame thrown out by the force of the wind reaches its end, it cannot be reckoned. Here the reckoning is to be understood in terms of the four propositions of the tetralemma. Such reckonings are based on a total misconception of the phenomenon of fire. Comment. Here I uh, would just like to share Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation and mm, I am continuing also with the next two verses as I find they are important too get the full flavor of this passage. As a flame thrown out by a gust of wind, Upasiva said, the Blessed One, 
goes out and cannot be designated. So the Muni, liberated from the mental body, goes out and cannot be designated. But does one who has gone out not exist? Or else is he healthy through eternity? Explain this matter clearly to me, O Muni, for this Dhamma has been understood by you. There is no measure of one who has gone out, Upasiva, said the Blessed One. There is no means by which they might speak of him. When all phenomena have been uprooted, all pathways of speech have also been uprooted. Yeah, from my personal understanding, this is a particularly significant uh, statement. That basically, the, the Nibbana is in some way beyond the reach of language. End of comment. It seems that the deeper connotations of the word Nibbana in the context of Paticca Samuppada were not fully appreciated by the commentators. And that is why they went in search of a new etymology. They were too shy of the implications of the word extinction. Probably to avoid the charge of nihilism, they felt compelled to reinterpret certain key passages on Nibbana. They conceived Nibbana as something existing out there in its own right. They would not say where, but sometimes they would even say that it is everywhere. With an undue grammatical emphasis, they would say that it is on coming to that Nibbana that lust and other defilements are abundant. Nibbana nga gamma ragada yo ki nati. Ekameva nibbana nga raga nkayo do sak nkayo mohak nkayo ti but nchati. But what do we find in the joyous utterances of the teras and teris who had realized Nibbana? As recorded in such texts as Tera and Terigata, they would say, Si tibutos me nibbuto, I am grown cool, extinguished as I am. The word Si tibhuta and nibbuta had a cooling effect even to the listener, though later scholars found them inadequate. Extinction is something that occurs within an individual and it brings with it a unique bliss of appeasement. As the Ratana Sutta says, Laddha mudha nibbuting bunjamana. They experience the bliss of appeasement, one free of charge. Normally, appeasement is won at a cost, but here we have an appeasement that comes gratis. From the worldly point of view, extinction means annihilation. It has connotations of a precipice that is much dreaded. That is why the commentators conceived of it as something out there, on reaching which the defilements are abandoned. Nibbana nagama raga da yoki nati. Sometimes they would say that it is on seeing Nibbana that craving is destroyed. Comment. This uh, last statement has been uh, misunderstood. Uh, the Actually, in the next sermon, the second sermon, the Venbanyana Nanda takes up a passage from Ratana Sutta. I'm here giving the references, which says Sahavas Dasana Sampadaya, that uh, uh, with the vision of stream entry, it is that the three fetters are destroyed. So it is very clear that it is the actual experience of Nibbana itself at stream entry and at the higher levels of awakening, which uh, accomplishes the destruction of fetters or eventually of craving. And so in keeping in mind what he says in the next sermon, then it becomes clear that when he says now here on seeing Nibbana that craving is destroyed, when he criticizes that, he is only intending, I think, to criticize the idea that Nibbana is something far out away in the distance and when seeing it from far away, that then craving is destroyed. He, I believe, wants to bring in the immediacy of the experience of Nibbana and also to counter a tendency in the commentaries to make Nibbana and the destruction of defilements into two separate things. This becomes particularly evident in the commentary conception of path and fruit as two mind moments, whereas in the suttas path means the whole trajectory of however many years it takes until the breakthrough and the fruit means the uh, destruction of defilements, the extinction of fetters, the personality change that comes about 
after that experience, through that experience, in that experience. But this is a topic we will come back later. End of comment. There seems to be some contradiction in the commentarial definitions of Nibbana. On the one hand, we have the definition of Nibbana as the exit from craving, which is called a weaving. <coughs> and on the other, it is said that it is on seeing Nibbana that craving is destroyed. To project Nibbana into a distance and to hope that craving will be destroyed only on seeing it is something like trying to build a staircase to a palace one cannot yet see. In fact, this is a simile which the Buddha had used in his criticism of the Brahmin's point of view. In the Dhamma Chakka Bhavattana Sutta, we have a very clear statement of the third noble truth. Having first said that the second noble truth is craving, the Buddha goes on to define the third noble truth in these words Tasa yeva tanhai asesa virara nirodho chago patpini sango mutti annalayo. This is to say that the third noble truth is the complete fading away, cessation, giving up, relinquishment of that very craving. That it is the release from and non-attachment to that very craving. In other words, it is the destruction of this very mass of suffering which is just before us. In the suttas, the term tanhatankayo, the destruction of craving, is very often used as a term for nibbana. But the commentator says that destruction alone is not nibbana, kaimatang na nibbana. But the destruction of craving itself is called the highest bliss in the following words of the Udana. Yanche kama sukang loke, yanche nyang divyang sukang, tanakankaya sukkasete, kalang nanganti solasen. Whatever bliss from sense desires there is in the world, whatever divine bliss there is, all these are not worth one sixteenth of the bliss of the destruction of craving. Many of the verses found in the Udana are extremely deep, and this is understandable, since Udana means a joyous utterance. Generally, a joyous utterance comes from the very depth of one's heart, like a sigh of relief. As a matter of fact, one often finds that the concluding verse goes far deeper in its implications than the narrative concerned. For instance, in the Udapana Sutta, we get the following joyous utterance, coming from the Buddha himself. King Kayara Udapanena, Hapa Chesabhadasiyung, Tanhaya Mula Tochetva, Kissa Pariyasanangchari. What is the use of a well if water is there all the time? Having cut craving at the root in search of what should one wonder. This shows that the destruction of craving is not a mere destruction. Comment. Yeah, I just would like to draw out a little more the statement by the Venerable Nyanananda that the verses often go far deeper in the applications than the narrative concerned. And this verse is a very good example for it because uh, the story, the narrative story um, given in the Udana uh, has uh, Brahmins who have blocked a well with chaff in order to prevent the Buddha and his monks from drinking. And this um, story is quite out of keeping with the verse and in fact uh, Bande uh, in his studies in the origins of Buddhism says that the author of the prose seems to have grossly misunderstood the verse which intends water in no more than a merely figurative sense and from a comparative perspective it is interesting the Chinese parallel to that stanza does not have any prose story and this is a general tendency of the Udana that what originally seemed to have been commentarial stories have become part of the text itself. We have the same situation in the case of the Attakavaga of the Sutanipata, but converse in the sense that here the Pali version has only the verses and the Chinese has the stories that in the Pai tradition we find only in the commentaries. And so this is uh, significant in so far as I think with the stories, the prose stories in the Udana, are a general tendency is for them to 
be similar to commentary stories or sometimes material we might find in the Vinaya. There are more miracles, there are sometimes also later influences that we can detect. So I think when we put like the four Pali Nikayas together as a representative of early Buddhism, I would add uh, Sutta Nipata, Dhammapada, Itivutaka and the Udana verses, but not the Udana prose, just as a general idea of the stratification of texts. End of comment. Craving is a form of thirst, and that is why Nibbana is sometimes called Pipasavinayo, the dispelling of the thirst. To think that the destruction of craving is not sufficient is like trying to give water to one who has already quenched his thirst. But the destruction of craving has been called the highest bliss. One who has quenched his thirst for good is aware of that blissful experience. When he sees the world running here and there in search of water, he looks within and sees the wellspring of his bliss. However, to most of our scholars, the term Tanhakankaya appeared totally negative, and that is why they hesitated to recognize its value. In such conventional usages as Nibbana and Agama, they found a grammatical excuse to separate that term from Nibbana. According to the Buddha, the cessation of existence is Nibbana, and that means Nibbana is the realization of the cessation of existence. Existence is said to be an eleven-fold fire, so the entire existence is a raging fire. Lust, hate, delusion, all these are fires. Therefore Nibbana may be best bended by the word extinction. When, once the fires are extinguished, what more is needed? But unfortunately, Venerable Buddha Gosa was not prepared to appreciate this point of view. In his Visuddhimagga, as well as in the commentary Sarata Pakasini and Sammohavinodani, he gives a long discussion on Nibbana in the form of an argument with an imaginary heretic. <clears throat> Some of his arguments are not in keeping with either the letter or the spirit of the Dhamma. First of all, he gets the heretic to put forward the idea that the destruction of lust, hate and delusion is Nibbana. Actually, the heretic is simply quoting the Buddha word, for in the Nibbana Sutta of the Asankata Sangyutta, the destruction of lust, hate and delusion is called Nibbana. Ragakankayo, dusakankayo, mokankayo, idang bucchati Nibbana. The words Ragakankayo, dusakankaya and mohakankaya together form a synonym of Nibbana. But the commentator interprets it as three synonyms. Then he argues out with the imaginary heretic that if Nibbana is the extinguishing of lust, it is something common even to the animals, for they also extinguish their fires of lust through enjoyment of the corresponding objects of sense. This argument ignores the deeper sense of the word extinction as it is found in the Dhamma. In the Mahagandya Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha gives the simile of a man with a skin disease sitting beside a pit of hot embers to explain the position of lustful beings in the world. That man is simply trying to assuage his pains by the heat of the fire. It is an attempt to warm up, not to cool down. Similarly, what the lustful beings in the world are doing in the face of the fires of lust is a warming up. It can in no way be compared to the extinction and the cooling down of the Arahants. As the phrase Nibmuting Bunjamana implies, that extinction is a blissful experience for the Arahants. It leaves a permanent effect on the Arahant, so much so that upon reflection he sees that his influxes are extinct, just as a man with his hands and feet cut off knows upon reflection that his limbs are gone. It seems that the deeper implications of the word Nibbana have been obscured by a set of arguments which are rather misleading. In fact, I came forward to give these sermons for three reasons. Firstly, because the Venerable Great Preceptor invited me to do so. Secondly, in the hope that it will be of some benefit to my co dwellers in the Dhamma. And thirdly, because I myself felt rather concerned about the inadequacy of the existing interpretations. What we have said so far is just about the word Nibbana as such. 
quite a number of suttas on Nibbana will be taken up for discussion. This is just a preamble to show that the word Nibbana in the sense of extinction has a deeper dimension, which has some relevance to the law of dependent arising, Paticca Samuppada. <coughs> By bringing in an etymology based on the element Vana, <coughs> much of the original significance of the word Nibbana came to be undermined. On quite a number of occasions the Buddha has declared that the cessation of suffering is Nibbana, or else that the destruction of craving is Nibbana. Terms like Dukkankanirō, Dho and Tanhakankayo have been used as synonyms. If they are synonyms, there is no need to make any discrimination with regard to some of them by existing on a periphrastic usage like Agamma. Yet another important aspect of the problem is the relation of Nibbana to the holy life of Brahmacharya. It is said that when the holy life is lived out to the full, it culminates in Nibbana. In the Radha Sanyutta of the Samyutta Nikaya, we find the Venerable Radha putting a series of questions to the Buddha to get an explanation. First of all, he asks, Sammada Sanang Panabanda Kim Atiyang, for what purpose is right vision? And the Buddha gives the answer, Sammada Sanang Ko Radha Nibbidatam. Radha, right vision is for the purpose of disgust or dejection, and that is to say, disgust for samsara. Comment, as I mentioned before, I prefer disenchantment over disgust. End of comment. The next question is, for what purpose is disgust? And the Buddha answers, disgust is for dispassion. What is the purpose of dispassion? The purpose of dispassion is release. What is the purpose of release? The purpose of release is Nibbana. Last of all, Venerada puts the question, Nibbana Panabanda Kimmatiyang, for what purpose is Nibbana? And the Buddha gives this answer, Achisara Rada Panyang Na Sakni Panyas Paryantang Gahitum, Nibbana Gadani Radha Brahmacharyang Vusati, Nibbana Parayanang Nibbana Paryosanang. Rather, you have gone beyond the scope of your questions. You are unable to grasp the limit of your questions. For rather, the holy life is merged in Nibbana. Its consummation is Nibbana. Its culmination is Nibbana. Comment. Just like to offer Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. You have gone beyond the range of questioning, Rada. You weren't able to grasp the limit to questioning. For Radha, the holy life is lived with Nibbana as its ground, Nibbana as its destination, Nibbana as its final goal. This shows that the holy life gets merged in Nibbana, just as rivers get merged in the sea. In other words, where the holy life is lived out to the full, Nibbana is right there. That is why Venerable Nanda, who earnestly took up the holy life encouraged by the Buddha's promise of heavenly nymphs, attained Arahanthood almost in spite of himself. At last he approached the Buddha and begged to relieve him of the onus of his promise. This shows that when one completes the training in the holy life, one is already in Nibbana. Only when the training is incomplete can one go to heaven. Here then is a result which comes of its own accord. So there is no justification for a periphrastic usage like on reaching Nibbana. No glimpse of a distant object is necessary. At whatever moment the Noble Eightfold Path is perfected, one attains Nibbana then and there. Now, in the case of an examination, after answering the question papers, one has to wait for the results to get a pass. Here it is different. As soon as you have answered the paper correctly, you have passed immediately and the certificate is already there. This is the significance of the term Anya used in such contexts. Anya stands for full certitude of the experience of Nibbana. The experience of the fruit of Aranship gives him the final certificate of his attainment, Anya Palo. That is why Nibbana is called something to be realized. One gets the certitude that birth is extinct and that the holy life is lived out to the full. Kina, Jati, Vusitang, Brahmacharyam. Of course, there are some who still go on asking, what is the purpose of Nibbana? And it's to answer this type of question that many scholars go on hair-splitting. Normally in the world, whatever one does has some purpose or other. All occupations or trades and businesses are for gain and profit. 
Thieves and burglars also have some purpose in mind. But what is the purpose of trying to attain Nibbana? What is the purpose of Nibbana? Why should one attain Nibbana? It is to give an answer to this question that scholars brought in such phrases as Nibbana and Pana Agama, on reaching Nibbana. They would say that on reaching Nibbana, craving would be destroyed. On closer analysis, it would appear that there is some fallacy in this question. For if there is any aim or purpose in attaining Nibbana, Nibbana would not be the ultimate aim. <clears throat> in other words, if Nibbana is the ultimate aim, then there should be no aim in attaining Nibbana. Though it may well sound a tautology, one has to say that Nibbana is the ultimate aim for the simple reason that there is no aim beyond it. However, this may need more explanation. Now, as far as craving is concerned, it has the nature of projection or inclination. It is something bent forward with a forward view, and that is why it is called Bhavanetti, the leader in becoming. It leads one on and on in existence, like the carrot before the donkey. So that is why all objects presented by craving have some object or purpose as a projection. Craving is an inclination. But what is the position if one makes the destruction of craving itself one's object? Now craving, because of its inclining nature, is always bent forward. So much so that we get an infinite progression. This is for that, and that is for the other. As the phrase tanna pono bhavika implies, craving brings up existence again and again. But this is not the case when one makes the destruction of craving one's aim. When that aim is attained, there is nothing more to be done. All this brings us to the conclusion that the term tanhakkayo, destruction of craving, is a full-fledged synonym of Nibbana. Well, this much is enough for today. Time permitting and life permitting, I hope to continue with these sermons. I suppose the most venerable great preceptor made this invitation with the idea of seeing one of his children at play. For good or for bad, I have taken up the invitation. Let the future of the sasana be the final judge of its merits. Comment. Yeah, so this is the end uh, of the first sermon, <coughs> and it is uh, very difficult to summarize because the Venerable Nyanananda has this ability of weaving in different points into one continuous uh, presentation. Uh, but I just like for the purpose of discussion and ease to point out two salient points in my own take on this sermon uh, that uh, come up for me. One is the definition of name and the other one is the fire imagery in relation to the term Nibbana. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to seeing uh, your comments and uh, suggestions on the discussion forum and then taking these up and the second sermon in